Everyone in town knew my family, the Bowers. We're considered cornerstones by some, never wavering in any community activity. Until this year. We experienced a tragedy. One that only now with the holidays past us I can talk about. It's an event that changed the meaning of this special time of year for us. And it's one that shook my faith to its core. It began shortly after Thanksgiving. A flyer posted on the school bulletin board of upcoming events. I saw that the theater director, Mr. Steele, was requesting people to try out for an upcoming nativity pageant, and my best friend Rachel suggested I try for the part of Mary. Besides sleeping with Tommy Anderson, you'd be perfect for the part, she teased. I immediately got red in the face and shoved her away, hoping no one else heard what she said. I knew I was going to be in the pageant anyway, though, because what Rachel was unaware of was the whole nativity was a family tradition. I had fond memories of working under Mr. Steele when I was a little girl, getting to dress up in costumes that were twice my size, pretending other students were sheep. We had been doing this for about as long as we had, so I didn't really expect there to be a change this year. Some people said it was playing favorites, but the truth was, not too many actually signed up for the play. My mom and dad were on board at the beginning, although this year, mom admitted her role would be limited thanks to being heavily pregnant. Sometimes I would dream that my new baby brother would be a Christmas baby, especially since I had prayed about wanting a little sibling for months. Those prayers were almost left unanswered when my mom had a scare that sent her to the ER. I was actually practicing my lines at the time. The younger boy that was chosen for Joseph was doing his best not to stare at my cleavage when Mr. Steele got the call. What was that? I asked him. Nothing, Bella. Just let's, let's continue with the play. I kept going for another ten minutes until we got another call. This time it was the stage director that answered and she rushed over to tell me. Your mom's in the hospital? I think the baby's coming early, she shrieked. Mr. Steele didn't seem too happy about the interruption, but reluctantly let me go. I arrived 20 minutes too late. The baby made it just fine, but it was a premature infant, and the doctors informed mom that he would need to be in a neonatal ICU for the next month. Her mom was in tears. Glad that everything turned out okay, but doctors warned that we weren't out of the woods yet. That first night, staring at my baby brother through the glass and wishing that I could cradle him, it was... it was hard. I wanted everything about that moment to be perfect, but instead his arrival into the world was filled with unexpected pain. Mr. Steele called in the morning to check on everything. He had always been so close to our family, so initially I didn't think much of it until I overheard a particular part of the conversation that was making my dad heated. Look, I'm sorry, but this is how it's going to have to be. Elizabeth needs to recover from birth, and I have to go back to work. Bella's the only one who can take care of her. I, I wish things were different. You know that this, this matters to us, but I'm afraid there's simply no other way. He barked as he hung up on the man. I just don't understand how that man can be so bullheaded. He said as I entered the room. What's going on? Is everything okay? I asked. He gave me a solemn face, but he didn't hide his frustration. Mr. Steele is expecting us to be able to participate in the nativity play. But I told him with everything that's happened, it'd be better if we took a step back and let others get a chance. It, it would be too stressful for us to juggle all of this. At the time, I was a little upset. But then I saw the reasonableness in Dad's suggestion. With the, the new baby and Mom recovering, I would need to help as much as possible around the house. It's not like I really enjoyed the play. It was different now that I was older. I'm sure that he'll understand. Probably just a little shocking to him, I told Dad. I went to bed that night in a hospital bed right alongside my mom, holding her hand and dreaming about everything being fine by Christmas. But that isn't how the story unfolded. Another call woke Dad around 4 a.m. the next morning, this time from a private number. He jumped up and started talking frantically to the person on the other side of the line, waking me up as well. You're sure? How could this even happen? No, I, I don't understand. I, 
I, do, I don't. It looked like he was in tears. I didn't say a word as I sat up and curled my feet under me, waiting for him to tell me what had happened. He was still holding the phone, looking at me like a, like a shell-shocked soldier as he muttered, Bella, our, our house. He was struggling to find the words as I saw his trembling hands and face, realizing that something horrible had occurred. It didn't take long to find out the truth since we lived in such a small town, it was all over the news. Local authorities respond last night to a house fire coming from the Indigo Court cul-de-sac, where they were able to successfully stop the blaze from spreading any further to neighboring houses. Fire Marshal Travis Brady stated that it appears the inferno was started due to a gas stove being left on. No one was injured during the incident. Our house was a smoldering ash now. Not even the bare bones remained. I couldn't even comprehend what we had lost. Our pastor told us we were lucky to be alive, but I didn't feel any lucky. And as I soon found out, I I really wasn't. The next call we got that day was from Mr. Steele. His tone had changed. I assume he had heard about the incident. This is the moment where all of us need to pull together and take care of one another. You can stay with me. My house is big enough, he told my dad. Dad declined the offer at first, but then, then the hospital informed us we could only stay there one more night, so we had little choice unless we wanted to be homeless. I was surprised at how large his house actually was. Two stories, five bedrooms, and yet completely alone. It made me wonder what had happened to his family, or if he ever had one. There were no portraits on the walls and no souvenirs to say that he traveled. Only thing he seemed to care about was his theater. There were countless awards. It was trophies, class pictures, and even more lining every square inch of his home. It was like a shrine to the arts. Come on in. Water's fine, he joked as we came inside. We had only one bag to share, but Mr. Steele promised that he would help us grab new clothes soon enough. I think this is how it was meant to be. Holidays are all about sharing and caring for each other. He said as he had finished prepping dinner. Everything was kind of awkward. Sitting there in a stranger's house, eating his food, even though we had just had an argument with him a day before. As we ate, we made small talk. But the elephant in the room couldn't be ignored. Thanks again for everything you've done for us, my dad commented as we finished the main course. If there's any way that we can repay you, just say the word. Mr. Steele wiped his mouth and coughed, looking at us eagerly. He did have something in mind. Well, I suppose it's probably wrong to bring it up. But the play needs you. I mean, now more than ever, I feel that you should take part, he answered. Dad didn't say a word, but I could tell that he was pissed. We'll discuss this later, he told the theater teacher as he got a plate for Mom and left for the guest room. Later that evening, I overheard them getting into a heated argument. I swear they were so loud the whole neighborhood heard them. It's just a stupid play, Harold. Stop pressuring us. Elizabeth needs to be here with the baby, and I'm too exhausted, Dad said. So that's it, then. This is the thanks that I get for letting you into my home. You treat me like this? I mean, you realize I could have you go to a shelter. In fact, I still could. I suggest you reconsider your tone with me. What? You're going to toss us out on the street because we don't want to do your ridiculous play. How is that the spirit of Christmas? I'm giving you a choice here, Peter. Just do what I say and this will all be fine. It's really not a big request. I don't see why you're making it out to be. In the morning, I was told that I'd be back playing Mary. I feigned excitement. Hope that dad would be doing this for the right reasons. Mom kept out of it. At the rehearsal, Mr. Steele was immediately in full theater mode, and by that I mean we no longer really mattered as people anymore. He expected us to know our lines and get them right the first time, and I noticed he was especially critical of me. He halted the production a few times to call me out, shaking his head, that I got a few simple verses wrong. Bella, I know that you've been out of practice for a few days, but this is absurd. You really need to focus on your work. At dinner, the criticisms continued. 
He was dissatisfied with how I appeared in the costume. I'm ordering new clothes that'll make you look more like the Virgin Mary. I need you to eat less. I highly doubt that she had so much weight on her, he commented. Dad put his fork down, this time choosing to not just sit idly as things began to deteriorate. Harold, I think you're going a bit too far. Too far is when you thought that you should step down. Especially with a play only a week away then, and now we're on the cusp of opening night and you want to continue the charade? This is too far. It's outrageous. You aren't going to starve my daughter just so that she can be better suited for a fictional role. Mr. Steele looked aghast. What do you mean, fiction? Peter, I suggest you watch what you say and do as you're told. I knew Dad wasn't going to just sit around for it, but Mom managed to hold him back. Something told me, though, that things weren't going to be easy from here on out. The next day I came downstairs expecting another shift in the ever-changing dynamic. I no longer felt truly safe here thanks to Mr. Steele's harsh tones and demeaning attitude. And then on top of it, Mom and Dad were nowhere to be found that morning. They're going to go grab a few things for tonight's performance. We should head out and get to practicing, Mr. Steele told me. I couldn't imagine how Mom would let the baby be on his own here, but I... I mean, I didn't want to question it. Still, I could tell that something was wrong. We drove to the theater early. There wasn't a car in sight. Mr. Steele instructed me to hurry inside, get changed, and I saw that shortly afterwards several others were arriving. All of them looked a little confused about what was going on, and I gathered very quickly that Mr. Steele had called them in for a last-minute rehearsal. I was in costume in less than ten minutes, and the stage producer was assisting with makeup. She seemed shaken up by something, too, as I stood there like a porcelain doll letting her doll me up. Is something wrong? I asked as I noticed she was holding back tears. <laughs> it's just... I'm so surprised to see you here. After everything you've gone through, bless your soul, she said with a soft smile. I'm not sure I completely understand what you're talking about, I said as I saw my co-star entering the backstage. Well, first there was the rush to the hospital, then your house, now the loss of your parents. It must be so much for you to handle, she explained. My mouth went dry. My parents are fine. We're staying with Mr. Steele. She covered her mouth and ran off as the theater director appeared in the shadows his gaze falling on my timid form. What was she talking about? Where are my parents? I asked. I couldn't even hear my voice. It sounded so frail. I was I was terrified of this man for reasons I couldn't explain, but my body understood that he was a threat. Your parents are fine, Bella. The play is about to start. You don't need to worry about that right now. He said as he reached for my arm. I pulled away and I snapped back. I'm not doing shit until you tell me where they are. His eyes blazed with a rage I had never seen before. Then he struck me across the face so hard that I fell. I warned your father what would happen to anyone that stood in the way of, of this holy occasion. He didn't listen. I wouldn't want to have to use your understudy in the final hours, but I will, Bella. Now... On your feet, and be ready. The scene's about to begin. I wiped away a tear as what he told me was sinking in. Had he really hurt them? Was he threatening to do the same to me if I didn't cooperate? All because of this strange obsession with the theater? I made my way to the curtain, peeking out to see if it was nearly a full house, Everyone had come to see how I would do. I couldn't stop my head from spinning. I didn't want to be here, but... I had to go through with it to protect my family. I stepped out, obeying the theater director implicitly, as I began to recite my lines. Already we had gotten to the part where Angel Gabriel explained the purpose of the virgin bath. 
I followed the wording to the letter, but I also felt that Mr. Steele was disapproving of the attempt or that he was holding my family hostage somewhere if I failed. After that first scene, I was rushed backstage where he pulled me into the dressing room. Infuriation filled his soul as he closed the door and snarled, Bella, I'm hoping what I've heard from the audience is just a malicious rumor, but I need the truth. So out with it, girl. Are you a virgin? I was speechless. I knew that Rachel had likely blabbed her big mouth, but I I never considered it would be something that wound up getting me into mortal danger. He shook his head, too frustrated to even lash out. You've dishonored this place. And you disrespect the very faith that you're representing. He opened the door back towards the main stage and added, Get out of my sight. I can... Go? I squeaked. It was beyond imagination for me to think that I was free from this control, but Mr. Steele didn't tell me twice. He tore the wig from my head, he kicked me out unceremoniously, leaving me with one goal to find out what he did to my family. As I ushered to the main auditorium, he made an announcement that another, younger girl would be filling the role of Mary. I think he did it at just the right moment to shame me, but I didn't care. I was focused on leaving this place and finding mom and dad and the baby. But soon I found out leaving wasn't an option. Several older boys working as stagehands blocked the exits, apologizing to me that Steele had insisted no one was allowed to leave during the performance. I knew their type. The ones that never questioned authority, reasoning with them would be, be like talking to a brick wall. Desperate for answers, I began to search the audience for the producer that had told me about my parents only moments ago. As I crouched down beside her, I said, What did you mean earlier? Please give me a straight answer. What happened to my family? She seemed confused that I didn't know. Mr. Steele told us all about how your dad abused your mom. I think after the baby was born, he simply snapped. The things he did to her, Bella, they're unspeakable. Again, I found myself at a loss for words. I looked towards the stage like a confused deer in the headlights, watching as the pageant drew to a close. Someone was bringing in a candle with the baby Jesus, and I could just barely make out that it was a real infant. And then my heart stopped. That's my brother, I said. Hardly able to speak when I realized what was happening, I found the courage to stand up amid the audience and shout anxiously, That's my brother! Everyone sitting around me likely thought I lost it. But I couldn't risk my baby brother being hurt. I started to climb over seats, frantic to get to the stage as I repeatedly shouted for the play to stop. I climbed over the edge of the stage, rushing straight to the understudy that was holding him and grabbing him from her arms. He felt so cold and I, I nearly fainted when I thought that he might be dead, but no. No, he definitely had a pulse. This needs to stop now, I said as I showed the audience how blue he was in the face. Several of them were suddenly becoming disturbed, wondering what the hell was going on, but then... Then it got ten times worse. A gunshot rang out and people screamed. Mr. Steele was standing beside me, grabbing my arm and holding the weapon near my neck, as my baby brother just barely made a wriggling motion. What had he done to him? No one is going anywhere, he snapped. As he pointed the weapon towards the crowd next, several people shrieked and some fainted. None of you have any idea how hard I worked for this. How I slaved over it to make it a masterpiece. He began to rant, talking about how he had tried to reason with my parents, how he needed us to cooperate to make this work. It would be destiny, he said. But destiny had another course to take. Another shot rang out. This time from the audience itself, Mr. Steele's eyes widened in horror as he looked down at his clean white shirt and how it was stained with red. He staggered towards the crowd, still mumbling about the importance of the play as he cascaded over the edge and fell to the ground. There was a deputy off duty in the crowd, the one that had fired the shot, and he ordered everyone to stay back as they checked Steele's body. The rest was not a hallmark ending. My parents were found asphyxiated in the car together in the director's garage. 
It was made to look like my father had been the culprit, but the confession and the strange behavior of Steele at the play had convinced everyone that he was insane. Me and my brother were placed in the foster system. We spent that Christmas in a homeless shelter. It wasn't shiny. It wasn't miraculous. We had each other. I found looking back at everything we endured that it's the only spark of hope to keep me going. Everything else, I close my eyes. I try to make it a bad dream. Until Christmas comes back again. Then the memories resurface and the nightmares. The nightmares start again. And then I remember I can't escape that awful play. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thanks so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. It's winter, I think. I don't know exactly how the seasons work or on what day it changes, but it's damn cold. And you know what's good when it's cold? Tea. Hot tea. And my wife sells hot tea at Ivory Monocle. Ivory Monocle has a whole bunch of different kinds of loose leaf tea, including creepypasta themed loose leaf tea, or uh, I guess Christmas and holiday themed loose leaf tea because tis the season. And you can get that right now at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to all of my contributors on Patreon. You guys are the real MVP. You guys keep the lights on here. And a very special thank you to all of the big skeleton patrons, such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Ars, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Masked Note, Rashad Collins, Joshua Mullen, Zavium, Dan Pham, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Ben Spates, Anna Storm, Jeremy H, Raltazol, Nana, The Morgan, Diamond Della, Melted Lake, Tully Sue, William King, Reaper 61167, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, I Soda Hatred, Nessie, Parafa Panda, Bardo Hawk 764, Melancholy Corpse, Ferb, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, at Grizzly Olsen Pro, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Miss Xandra, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Fried Chicken 12, Freddy Krueger, Michael Scarborough, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much for being a part of Patreon, and for everybody who's down there in the description, and everybody who even contributes just one dollar to patreon.com slash mrkbpasta. And, as always, my friends, sweet dreams.